morning, everyone, this morning. I appreciate your presence. I want to ask you to open your Bibles to Romans chapter 6. Actually going to be making progress uh, inch by inch like a caterpillar through Romans uh, is the way I'm going through this. But turn to Romans chapter 6. I failed to get uh, information to Kale uh, in the announcements, but uh, Kirk and Denise are traveling as well as Kevin and, and Haley Perrin uh, traveling and out of town today. So we, we do have... As we have the last several Sundays, we have, have a lot of folks that seem to be gone, but we're blessed with visitors this morning. We're so glad that you're here, uh, and we invite you to open your Bibles and study with us in Romans chapter 6. We've been going through a study of the book of Romans, and so far we have covered the first five chapters, and it has taken me a while to get through it. But we're going to be looking at chapter 6 this morning. I just want to remind you what we've been looking at. In chapter 1, we've seen the good news of the gospel as well as the guilt of the Gentiles. The reason it is good news is because of the guilt that man sustains. And chapter 2 just takes us then to the guilt of the Jews. And chapter 3 wraps it all up with the fact that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But God is faithful. This is the good news. That although all have sinned, God is trustworthy. He will do what he has promised. He will come through with what he has prophesied. In chapter 4 then, as uh, we're really introduced at the end of chapter 3 to this idea of God's grace and justification by faith. Not by the law of Moses, but justification by faith. So chapter 4 picks up with that and uses Abraham as a test case of justification by faith. We went through that uh, a number of weeks ago. Then when we get to chapter 5, we looked at the blessings of salvation by grace through faith and saw that we stand in this grace and that we have this hope and that we persevere. Uh, and then he goes in about uh, verse 12 and following uh, to explaining the likeness between Adam, the first man, and Christ who came as a man and the role that they both played, Adam introducing sin into the world and Christ introducing life and forgiveness into the world. And so as we wrap up there in chapter 5, I want you to note with me in verse 20, he says, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So that's the way that we finish there in chapter 5. In chapter 6, and we have some unfortunate chapter breaks, different books of the Bible. Uh, but, but what we're finding is a flow. And what we want to look at this morning is we see how each one of these first five chapters fits into the tapestry of the book of Romans and the tapestry of the Bible itself. Where does chapter 6 fit in? What is the flow of chapter 6? And I would suggest to you that chapter 6 is given what is revealed in chapter 6 is to help us to understand the overall objective or aim, the purpose, God's purpose or intent of this thing that he calls grace, this gift of grace. What is its objective? What is its aim? Because the very first question that is asked here in verse 1 of chapter 6, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. So Paul asked this particular question about this. So chapter 5 and verses 20 through 21, as sin abounded, grace abounded much more. What does that mean, though, to us in a practical way? Does sin not matter? The more that sin abounds, grace just a super abounds over it, so sin doesn't matter? Does God not see sin in our life? Harkrider asked that question in his book, and I think it's a good question to ask because there are a lot of people that believe that God doesn't see sin in our life. That when God looks down upon uh, one who has been redeemed, that the righteousness of Christ is like an umbrella or some, imper uh, some shield or barrier where God cannot see our sin. He only sees the righteousness of Christ. That's not what Paul was saying. That's not what the Holy Spirit revealed in chapter 5. Not in any way. God does see sin. And so where do we place the pieces of the puzzle or the mystery of salvation? 
Where do we place sin and grace and obedience and other things like that? And we, those questions come to mind as we finish chapter 5. What was Paul saying? You know, Paul starts out chapter 6 and verse 1. What shall we say then? What, what that really probably should be translated is, what am I saying then? What, what am I getting at here? Well, I want to tell you, Paul was not in any way saying that sin was good because it caused grace to reign. Don't, don't make that uh, a conclusion. And I don't believe that any Jew who would have picked this up and read it would have even been attracted to that concept. So it wasn't even a possibility that Paul's audience would have been rejoicing, thinking, oh, yay, he's preaching once saved, always saved. That's not what they were looking for. As a matter of fact, the Jewish believers were leaning more toward binding more than God had bound. They weren't looking for loosing more, per se. So I don't believe that that is any way what they were thinking. And I don't believe that anyone thought that he was arguing that. But I do believe that it's very likely that Paul's detractors would try to harness him with that doctrine. Remember, Paul had a lot of people that were, according to Philippians chapter 1, preaching the gospel, but they were trying to add affliction to Paul. And they were lying about him. They were, they were making certain accusations against him. And I wouldn't be surprised that they would not take this section of Romans chapter 5 and try to say that Paul, uh, that the necessary conclusion to Paul's doctrine of grace replacing the law of Moses meant that we just need to sin more so that grace will abound more. Because they would know that most Jews would say, well, that's ridiculous. If that's what Paul's preaching, I don't want any part of that. So Paul gets ahead of that and says, is that what I'm saying? Is that the point to this? And clearly it wasn't. We're looking at the objective of grace in salvation. And what we need to understand is that sin and grace are mutually exclusive. Now what that means is, Mutually exclusive means that two or more things or events cannot occur at the same time. That they are completely, that they completely contradict one another. It's a term that's used in statistics or logic or probability. Sin and grace then are incongruent with one another. The idea that I'm just going to sin more so that we'll get more grace and these will work together in some way is completely false. Sin and grace are at war with one another. They have opposing objectives, and we cannot continue in sin and continue in grace. So what then is the objective of grace? Well, I'll tell you, it's clearly not a free pass to sin. Now, that's the idea that a lot of people have. Now, they wouldn't put it that way, but their view of the grace of God, and one of the reasons we're going through the book of Romans, is because we're going to go through a study of neo-Calvinism, or as uh, I think Bruce Reeves put it in a recent series uh, in Athens, Alabama, soft Calvinism. It's not classic Calvinism, but, but it has all of the tenets of it. When we're going through that, the book of Romans is the book that is most misused in order to try to teach that, and that's why we're going through the book of Romans. There are a lot of Uh, 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 false views of God's grace and one of those is that God's grace is just going to cover everything that we do so we just keep on living the way that we live because Calvinism teaches that we can't live a holy life that that we there's something about our human nature our flesh that's inherently sinful and so God's grace is going to cover that as we continue to sin with this inherited depravity or nature of sin in us That's not at all. As a matter of fact, Romans chapter 6 is placed here to annihilate that idea. That is not the objective, the aim, the purpose of grace. As a matter of fact, that upends the whole objective of grace, that free pass to sin idea. And so the first thing that we see in verses 1 through 5 as we look at chapter 6, the first objective that I think that we're introduced to here is that grace was given so that we could be separated from sin. It's going to be called dead to sin in the text. So that we could be separated from sin and live an entirely new life. And we're introduced to this contrast of death and life in verses 1 and 2. 
Again, Paul says, what am I saying then? Back in chapter 5, verse 20 and 21. What am I saying? Do we continue in sin so that grace will abound even more? Of course not. Now I want you to notice something here. He didn't say, do we sin as a verb. He said, do we continue in sin? He's taught, now, I know that that would involve that we keep on sinning, but I think it's interesting the way that the Holy Spirit puts it here. Do we continue in this state of sin? He's going to contrast that with being baptized into Christ. And those are incongruent. <laughs> being in sin and being in Christ, they, they cannot, but they're mutually exclusive. So he's really primarily talking about, do we remain in the state that we were formerly in? He's talked about the fact that Jesus came to give life. He's saying, so what am I saying then, that we just stay where we were at, sinning, in sin, so that grace would abound even more? He says, absolutely not, certainly not, or no a thousand times. He's saying this is a ridiculous conclusion and is in contradiction to the whole point and the concept of the gospel. One of the greatest points of our salvation is the link between death and life. We must die in order to live. Notice over in 2 Timothy in chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and in verse 11. Paul said, this is a faithful saying. For if we died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. He's bringing in this idea of reigning and of dying and living. If we died with him, we shall live with him. These, these two must go together. You cannot live in sin and live a new life. That's the thing. You have to die to sin to live a new life. In order to live this new life, you've got to die first. You have to die to sin, which is to be separated from sin because death is a separation. That may be a new concept to some who are here this morning. And I know that for many of us, we've, we've heard this before. But I want to reiterate that when we find the word death in the Bible, death is referring, especially when it's used in a figurative sense, like dying to sin. Clearly, that's not physical death there. So what's he talking about? Well, death is referred to as a separation in James chapter 2 and in verse 26. James 2 and verse 26. Read this with me, if you will. James chapter 2 and verse 26. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. He takes a physical illustration that we all understand. You may not have really even thought that much about it. But physical death is when the inner man, the spirit of man, is separated from the body. And there's clearly a distinct difference when you see someone who's died. Their body changes. And it, and, and it, it is something that is, is clearly obvious that something that was there is no longer there. Well, that's the spirit. That is the inner man. And he's commenting on this here and he's saying in that same way as we see it in physical life in the metaphorical use of death, I, uh, he says faith without works is dead. These two have to be together. There is a synergy between faith and obedience that, is a, that makes it a living faith. But by that same token, when we're said to be dead in sin, Ephesians chapter 2, He's talking about a separation from God. In Isaiah 59, in verses 1 and 2, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened. Isaiah 59, verse 1. The Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor is ear heavy that it cannot hear. Verse 2 now. But your iniquities have separated you from your God. Sin separates us from God. It's in that way that he says that we're dead in sin. We're separated from God. He's our source of life. God is spirit, and he is that source of life, and being separated from him is to then be dead. So being dead to sin, we know that being dead in sin is to be separated from God, but being dead to sin or having died to sin means a separation from sin, not remaining in sin. So we have to follow these figures 
that the Holy Spirit is using here as he goes through chapter 6, we're going to have a lot of them. So, so be prepared. You need to highlight, you need to underline. But this idea of being dead to sin, here's what he's saying. You've got to be separated because what was the question? Do we continue or remain in sin that grace may abound? He says, certainly not. You died to sin. That's incongruent. That can't go together. You've got to be separate from sin. Do you not know? He says in verse 6. Uh, or I'm sorry, in verse 3. So as he, he, bring, uh, as he gives us this understanding in, in verse 2, then in verse 3 we begin to see the significance of being baptized into Christ and into his death. In verse 3 he says, or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? So here's another argument to make this same point. He's saying, what about your baptism? What was the significance of that? Why were you even baptized? Now hold, hold this thought, okay? If baptism is a sacrament, as is taught by practically everyone else that claims to be a Christian, in the Catholic Church, it is considered a sacrament. That's why little babies can be uh, 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 supposedly baptized, sprinkled, water poured on them. But even among denominations, when someone says that baptism is merely an outward sign of an inward grace, you know what that means? It's a sacrament. That it really has no impact, no effect, except on other people. It is to show other people something. That's a sacrament, okay? Okay. And his whole point here is, it's not. Your baptism was not just some sacrament. It had significance. You, when you were baptized, you entered into a relationship with Christ. That's what it means to be baptized into Christ. We're not literally crawling up inside of him. We're entering into a relationship with him. And a part of that relationship with him is that we take part in that death. Because the whole idea here of the gospel of Christ is his death, his burial, and his resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15. What is that in about the first five verses there? So he's saying, you, the, here's the significance. We have been baptized into, there's the Greek word ace, into, unto, or toward a relationship with Christ and thus into his death. Now, first of all, baptized into Christ, as I said before, is in contrast to remaining in sin. You're either in Christ or you're in sin. But the main objective that Paul seems to have is to say that if we're baptized into this relationship with Christ, then we have to share in his death. He's already talked about the significance of death. Now he's saying, look at your baptism. That shows you that there was something you had to die to. It's connected to the death of Christ. Now, let me say this. The death of Jesus was absolutely necessary as a sacrifice for our salvation. And it is often pointed out that baptism is the place where we contact the death of Christ. Therefore, baptism is necessary for salvation. And this is the passage that many go to in order to show that. Now, this may be a valid point. And it is unquestionably true that baptism is necessary for salvation. And that's going to be brought out clearly in the rest of this text. I just don't believe that this is the point that Paul was making about being baptized into his death. I, I don't believe that that is the point of the flow of this section of Romans is that here's where you reached his death or touched his death in order to be saved. His whole argument is about what death you died. He's saying Jesus died for your sins, but you were joined in the likeness of that death when you died to sin. Now again, as I said, it's a valid point, uh, but I don't believe that that is the point of this particular text right now. Still, in verses 8 through 11, we're going to deal with the implications of being baptized into death. So I don't want to get ahead of that text. <clears throat> But it's clearly in connection with verse 2 and having died to sin or be separated from sin. So he's talking about the significance of this death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and how our baptism was in the likeness of that. So in verse 4, he says, 
Therefore, we were buried with him. First of all, you were baptized into his death or you died to something and you were buried with him through baptism into death. So if you, if you joined him in his death, then you joined him in his burial. That's what baptism was all about. Now, again, the point that Paul is making here is not about the action of baptism, but it is a necessary conclusion, okay? <clears throat> Paul was not trying to get us to understand that baptism is immersion. I think that that was clearly understood by first century people because the meaning of the word the Holy Spirit used and that Paul used here by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, baptizo, is a word that means to dip, to plunge, to immerse, to be whelmed. And it is that idea of going under. They knew that. Paul didn't have to prove it to them. But what happened is that when our Bibles were translated, the translators were possibly, I don't know why, they didn't translate the word. You say, well, I have a word right here. Well, baptism is not a word. <laughs> baptism is really just taking a, a Greek word and anglicizing that Greek word. There was no such word as baptism. The word was immersed. That was the translation of baptizo. But people were being sprinkled at the time that this was translated. And so instead of translating it as it should have been, immerse, they made up a new word. And the word they made up was baptize or baptism. So he's, his point is not necessarily to, to prove that, but this clearly proves it. Because he says that it is a burial. There is no way that sprinkling water on a person would correspond with burial in any way. No way that pouring water on someone would correspond. Baptism is a burial. It's not a shower. He could have used any figure he wanted to. He said it's a burial. The action of baptism is clearly immersion. But then here's the point. Here's the point that the Holy Spirit is making. We were buried with him that we might be raised with him. You can't be raised without a burial is what he's saying. You, you have to be buried in order to be raised. But why do we have to be raised? Look at it here in verse 4. He says that you were uh, uh, buried with him through baptism and death that or in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, in the same way, in the same likeness, we also should walk how? Remaining in sin? No, in newness of life. Here's the whole end, the aim, the objective of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ, and that's what baptism is all about. You see it in that, what he's going to call the pattern of teaching. Uh, the, in in uh, verse uh, 17 and 18, or verse 17. So he's telling us here that we are buried, we die, and we're buried for the whole purpose that we be raised to walk in a new life. Now, there is no question that the likeness that we share with Christ forces us to see that he was not made alive until after he was buried. Okay? Jesus did not die on the cross, and then on the way to the tomb, he wakes up and he says, hey guys, I'm okay, I, I'm, I'm alive. And they, no, no, we're going to bury you. We're going to bury you so everyone sees you buried, and then we'll come back and get you in a little bit later. That didn't happen. He was not made alive until after he was buried. He was not made alive before he was buried. That was confirmed by all those who prepared his body in haste and buried him. Therefore, Again, another necessary conclusion. We cannot be made alive spiritually at the point of faith before our burial and resurrection and baptism. That is an impossibility. If we're in the likeness of his death and the likeness of his burial and the likeness of his resurrection, and that's exactly what this text says, you're reading it, right? then there is absolutely no way that we can be saved at the point of faith before baptism. There's no way around that. I know that Paul is not debating the issue of baptism for salvation here. I'm, but what I'm saying is that his points are crystal clear 
And it is a necessary conclusion that we can't be saved until we're raised because we're raised to walk in newness of life. And that corresponds perfectly with the new birth. In John 3, verses 3 through 5, Jesus says that unless we're born again, we cannot see the kingdom of God. Unless we're born of water and the Spirit. We cannot see the kingdom of God. That new birth, yes, it involves water. And we walk in newness. That's when we're born again. Is coming up out of that water. And that's exactly what he's saying in Galatians 3, 26 through 27. I'd love to explore all of that with you. But uh, that point needs to be made. But here's the objective. Go to verse 5. In verse 5, for, the Greek word gar, meaning because... He says, we we did all of this, we died with him, we're buried with him, and we were raised with him, verse 5, because if we've been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly also shall we be in the likeness of his resurrection. What's the objective? The death of Christ was absolutely necessary for our salvation, and it had an objective beyond our initial salvation. Yeah, it was necessary for us to be forgiven of our sins, in obedience to the gospel, but it has an objective beyond that. And likewise, our baptism into his death, burial, and resurrection is absolutely necessary for our salvation, but it has an objective beyond our initial salvation. What is that? To live a new life, not a life in sin or in the dominion or under the dominion of sin, but a new life of righteousness. For, he says, because, verse 5, if we have been united together in the likeness. If, then. It's just a logical consequence. If, then. But what exactly are we alive to? Well, that brings us then to verse 6. And really, verses 6 through 14, the second objective of God's grace. What have we been made alive to? It is to be free from the slavery of sin. We've been set free from the dominion and slavery of sin. That we should no longer be slaves of sin. Verse 6, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. We were not just living in a realm of transgression, but we were actually slaves there. We need to get that. That before we were baptized, before we obeyed the gospel, before we were justified by faith, an obedient faith, we were not only in sin, but we were slaves there. Kind of reminds me of the story of Pinocchio and Pleasure Island. You know, they were, it was advertised as free fun, but they all turned into donkeys if they stayed there. And then they were sold as slaves, you know. And that's what happens with sin. It's advertised as pleasure but it's passing pleasure. And what people don't realize is that it brings bondage and it brings slavery. This slavery was one where the desires or lusts of the flesh were the masters of our bodies and our bodies were presented as instruments to fulfill that lust. That's the point that he's making here. And the Holy Spirit makes this argument. If we died with him, then there is a sense in which our old man, the man ruled by sin and in slavery to sin, there is a sense in which that old man was crucified with Christ and that was necessary so that the body that served sin like a slave could actually be done away with. We want to get rid of that. Now that's not talking literally about my body is going to leave and I'm going to get a new body here. But in a metaphorical sense, metaphorically, this body that has served sin and satisfied its own lust is done away with. And if that old man, that body that serves sin is done away with, then we are no longer under the slavery. We're no longer a slave of sin. The gospel then is the emancipation proclamation. It's telling us you don't have to be a slave anymore, but you've got to do away with the way that your body has been living. That old man, where your body was reigning, where sin was reigning and using your body, your body being presented to sin or to be used for sin. He's telling us then in verse 7, for he who has died has been freed from sin. 
You've died to sin. You've been set apart from it. And as a result of that, that brings freedom. That old man's done away with. And I want to point this out. That word freed in verse 7 is the Greek word dikaio. If I am saying that right, I know that I'm probably emphasizing the, the syllables there. Dikaio. Uh, that, that just doesn't sound right. But it is the same word that's translated justified or justification throughout the book of Romans. And we'll find that uh, quite a number of different places. Romans chapter 5 and verse 1, he says, therefore, having been justified by faith, same word here. So in verse 7 of chapter 6, when he says, for he who has died to sin has been freed from sin, what he's actually saying is he who has died to sin has been justified from sin. He has been declared as being right with God. So I want you to see the connection between being made just, being justified, and being freed. They're one and the same. But I think that this would be better translated justified. That there is a correspondence to being freed. And it appears the translators were seeing a contrast to slavery and sin, verse 6. So they use the word freed, but the word is actually justified. We'll see in a moment how exactly that's accomplished. But by God's grace, we can die to sin, put away the old man, and be innocent again, making it possible to live free from the bondage of sin. That's the idea given here. All by God's grace. What's the objective of grace? What's the aim of grace? So that you don't have to be a a slave to sin anymore. So that you don't have to remain in sin. Once again, God's grace is incongruent with a continued life in sin. Now look at verse 8. In verse 8, he says, Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Now he's going to connect our dying with Christ, dying to sin, with living with him. He's already shown us the significance of our baptism. Now he's going to tell us what that means. And we're going to have more about that whole thing of rising to walk in newness of life. If we died with Christ, we shall also live with him. When Christ came to this earth and took on flesh and blood, he took part in mortality. He was given a body like ours that was subject and susceptible to decay and death, and he died. Physical death has dominion over every man. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27, it is appointed to men to die once. And so what he's saying here, go on with me to verse 9, knowing that Christ having been raised from the dead dies no more, death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. So notice this. Since Christ was raised from the dead, he, no longer, he is no longer in a mortal body, so he'll never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. That's what verse 9 is saying. His death, which was for our sins, he says in verse uh, uh, 10, was once for all. There's that Greek word, hapax, that we see so often in Hebrews. In chapter 9 and chapter 10, we see it again in Jude where he speaks about uh, the faith being once for all delivered to the saints. It is a word that pertains to a single occurrence, decisively unique, once and for all. That was the death of Jesus. He doesn't have to keep dying again and again and again for our sins. He dies no more. Therefore, what? What does that mean if he dies no more? He lives forever unto God. Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 25. Hebrews 7 25. Make a note of that. He lives forever to make intercession for us. What is he living for? Doing the will of God. I know he is God. He's doing that will just as he did when he was here on earth. But here's the likeness. He's saying, yes, he died and we died in that likeness. He died and we died to sin. He died once for all and lives unto God. And so, in verse 11, Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but what? Alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's what he wants us to do. So the objective of grace is to make it possible for us to die to sin once and for all and to live unto God forevermore. That's the objective, not to continue in sin. 
But then in verses 12 through 14, we're going to learn how to not let sin reign. Because he talked about sin reigning back in chapter 5, but how do we do that? Look at verse 12. Therefore, in verse 12, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lust. Now I want you to just see right here. Since God's grace has allowed you to die to sin, to be set free from sin, to obtain a new life, be deliberate about what you live to and how the new man is presented. You see verse 13? Do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness. Be careful about how the new man is presented. Sin is allowed to reign or have dominion over us, look at verse 12, when we obey it in its lusts. Sin is not some power that we cannot resist. Sin is not something that, that is this uh, a force that we can't overcome. No, sin reigns. Yeah. You know how? When we obey it. He's saying all you've got to do is say, no. Did you know that? I know sometimes it doesn't feel like it. Maybe we get ourselves so deep into sin, so deep into some addiction, we say, I don't think I can do this. Jesus says, yes, you can. You take it down from the throne. You quit obeying it in its lust. That's what it's all about. The good news is we have a choice. We can say no. That's what he's going to tell us in Romans 13 and in verse 14 when he says, make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. You can decide that. That's a choice you can make. And this is exactly what we were raised and made alive for. We don't have to be a slave to our lust. We just have to be deliberate about who and what we live for. But how is that accomplished? He says, do not present your members as instruments of sin. Last week, we looked at uh, a living sacrifice. Present your bodies a living sacrifice. I pointed out that that word present is a word that means to offer as a sacrifice. And he's saying, quit doing that. Quit offering your, your body as a sacrifice or as an act of worship to sin. But instead, offer your bodies unto God. The Holy Spirit's saying we don't have to let sin reign in our body. Our body's not inherently sinful. Our body is not possessed. We just have to make up our mind that we're not going to present, or that is, offer as a sacrifice the members of our body to the slave master of sin, to be instruments or weapons of unrighteousness to sin, but instead we can and must present and offer our bodies to God. Look at verse 19. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness to holiness. It's really this simple. We make a deliberate, determined choice to use our bodies for righteousness. And look at verse 14. This is all because of grace. Verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you for you're not under law but under grace now this ver a verse has been abused and misused to say that we're no longer under law of any kind that cannot be farther from the truth we're under law to christ uh uh first corinthians in chapter uh uh first corinthians chapter 9 verse 23 we're under law to christ uh we there uh, if there is no law there's no transgression romans 4 and verse 15 this is, and I re recommend you go back and listen to the sermon on ellipsis. This is a figure of speech, speech called ellipsis, where words are omitted for clarity. And the words that are omitted in a not but sentence structure is not only but especially. He's saying for you are not only under law, but especially under grace. Under the law of Moses, they were under law without the provision of grace. And they were in bondage. He says we're no longer like that. We now, under the law of Christ, have a provision of grace so you don't have to be in slavery to sin. Don't let sin have dominion over you. I want to suggest that chapter 7 is going to expound on this aspect of the dominion or slavery of sin under the law of Moses. That's what it's primarily going to deal with when we get to it. Remember this concept right here. And that brings us to our third objective, and that is... Grace is so that we may obtain everlasting life. In verse 15, what then shall we sin because we're not under law but under grace? Certainly not. Again, he's coming back to this absurd conclusion. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? 
Again, it's our choice. We make that decision. And it's all about this, death or righteousness. We make a choice regarding our master and the fruit of our labor or service. What do you want to come out of what you live for? What do you want to be the end product? He said it's either going to be death or it's going to be righteousness. You make that decision. And choosing to continue in sin is choosing to be a slave of the merciless slave master of sin, which leads to more sin. It's, it's just, it, it's never ending. And the outcome of our labor will be death. But choosing to obey Christ is choosing the easy yoke of the meek and lowly master, Jesus. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30. And the outcome is everlasting life. The choice is that simple. What do you want to accomplish? But here, I want you to notice quickly with me in verses 16 through 18. He says, do you not know that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey, you are that one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of what? Obedience leading to righteousness. Now here again, the book of Romans is misused and abused by Calvinists to tell us that we can't do anything in regard to our salvation or we nullify grace. But in the chapter that tells us the objective of grace, he tells us that obedience is involved. And that it's really a choice of whether or not we are going to uh, uh, sin or whether or not uh, be slaves of sin or obedience leading to righteousness. Then in verse 17, but God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered or entrusted. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. When were we set free from sin? After we obeyed. So the Calvinistic concept that obedience and works are cast out by grace is a complete uh, misconception and it does violence to the book of Romans is completely annihilated by Romans chapter 6. The chapter that tells us about grace tells us that obedience is our part. Grace is God's part. Obedience is our part to bring about that uh, uh, that everlasting life. So verse 18, we are uh, uh, set free in order to be a slave of righteousness. Verse 19 talks about the habitual nature of sin and how sin leads to more sin. And that is the, the, uh, uh, what is so terrible about the slavery of sin. It's like quicksand. We just keep going further and further down. Satan lies to us, causing us to think that we can sin just once, but sin triggers this chain of wicked events. It's very difficult to stop. We are free. He says, though, as he closes, that when we were free to righteousness, in regard to righteousness, verse 20, he says, what was your fruit then in those things you were ashamed of? That word free means without restraint. It's the way a lot of people want to live their life. It's not real freedom. But it is being free of restraint. That's the way a person lives in sin. They don't want anyone to tell them what they do. But you know, it's a little bit different word that's translated free down here in verse 22. But now having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness. The word free from sin in verse 22 is a different word. It is, I mean, they have the same base word, but it is a different word. And it conveys their being liberated from sin. So he's saying, which freedom do you choose? In verse 23, we're going to either receive wages or a gift. Wages is what you deserve. If we decide to remain in sin, then grace will have no impact on us. If we decide to remain in sin, we will receive wages, what we deserve, which is death. But if we decide that we're going to receive the grace of God and be in Christ, then we don't receive what we deserve we receive the gift of God, which is eternal life. The good news that Romans tells us about is brought out so clearly in chapter 6 that it's primarily about the aim, the intent, the purpose of grace. How wonderful. Grace, grace, wonderful grace, greater than all our sins. If you're here this morning and you haven't obeyed the gospel of Christ, as is brought out here in verse eight, uh, 18, rather, then you haven't been set free from your sin. But you can do that this morning. Come believing in Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God. Confess your faith in Him. Repent of your sins. 
and be baptized in water for the remission of sins. You can do that and we can assist you. Whatever your need is, be made right with God this morning before it's too late. Won't you please come while we stand and sing the invitation?